Hello and welcome to my uh, presentation on magnetic fields. This is going to cover some of the topics that we're going to see in chapter 27. So we've all seen uh, different magnets in in nature. We've seen hopefully uh, horseshoe magnets, different refrigerator magnets, and maybe even some bar magnets. If you've ever taken apart a speaker um, from a radio or a stereo, then you've seen um, cylinder magnets that have a north and south pole kind of like this and the north and south pole of the magnet is where the magnetic effect is strongest as you've seen if you've ever um, experimented with magnets if you were to suspend a lightweight magnet from a string um, the north pole of that magnet will always point toward earth's north pole and that's uh, essentially a compass needle so if you've tried that experiment then you you know what I'm talking about so we can define a magnetic field for each of these magnets or how does the magnet interact with its surroundings and one way to do that is just to place the magnet in um, a tray of iron filings and then let those iron filings trace out um, a path and that path looks something like uh, the image on the top and you can see these are field lines that uh, kind of wrap around the magnet and you can see that more iron filings will um, conglomerate at the ends showing that the magnetic field is stronger at the ends um, so the bottom picture defines a magnetic field as we're going to use it in class which uh, we need a convention so from now on the magnetic field will leave the north pole of the magnet and come back around to the South Pole. So magnetic field lines go out of the North Pole and into the South Pole. Okay, and um, notice that the iron filings are attracted to both positive and negative. So even though magnets themselves, we know that two North Poles or two South Poles repel each other. So like poles repel, unlike poles attract. Um, a non-magnet, um, excuse me, a non-magnetized or, or an unmagnetized iron filing will be attracted to each pole. And we know that the Earth has a magnetic field, so obviously the Earth must have a magnetic field to to turn a compass needle and to have that effect on a compass needle. And we know that since the north pole of the compass needle points toward Earth's north that must actually be south okay so that is a little tricky but the picture kind of shows it clearly um, and notice that the earth's north and south magnetic poles are not lined up with the actual geographic poles they're actually at an angle and that angle is called magnetic declination um, also earth's magnetic field does not um, run parallel to Earth's surface. It actually has a dip angle, which is the angle that it makes with, say, uh, your room. It'll, these magnetic field lines come down at an angle, so they're not parallel. So we've got the magnetic declination and the dip angle. You'll see these when you do um, one of the labs for magnetism. So we know that bar magnets or any magnet will either repel or attract other magnets. So this figure shows north poles repelling, south poles repelling, and unlike poles attracting. So what is the difference between this attraction and electric charges? Well, there are numerous differences, but electric charges, positive and negative, can be isolated. We can have a single um, negatively charged object or a single positively charged object, and Magnetic poles cannot be isolated like this. If you break a magnet, you're going to get two new magnets, each with a north and south pole, as shown. If you break those, you get two new magnets, and you can keep on breaking them, and then eventually you're still going to get two new magnets, both with a north and south pole. So um, we're seeing that the magnetic effect is a completely different um, idea and phenomenon than electric charge. And electric field. So different scientists have done experiments with electricity and magnetism. Um, Hans Christian Orsted found that when you run a high current through a wire, um, 
compass needles will actually change direction near that wire. So we need to talk about what is a current, first of all. Um, so please, you know, look through the book and read a formal definition of electric current. And I'm also going to talk about this in class tomorrow. But electric current is nothing more than moving charge. So charges are measured in coulombs. Um, speed is measured in meters per second. Um, so we have per second as our rate. So coulombs per second gives you current. So how many coulombs are moving past a certain point every second would give you current. And that's measured in units called amperes. Um, so we know what current is. Current is moving charge per unit time measured in amperes. And we use the variable uh, capital I, or sometimes lowercase i, to denote current. So these compass needles, if there's current flowing through this wire or moving charges through this wire, the compass needles will change direction to take this circular shape. And there's a right-hand rule um, associated with this. We're going to be using a lot of right-hand rules in class. Um, so this is our new greeting for the new millennium. Um, if you were to place your fingers around the wire, the fingers of your right hand, with your thumb in the direction of the current, um, magnetic field lines would make circular paths in the direction of your fingers, as shown. So take time to study this and to imagine taking this wire and curving it into a circle like the image on the right. And then you can picture the magnetic field lines as kind of taking a donut shape around that. So this is a cutaway view, but these magnetic field lines extend outward and inward uh, into and out of the page, kind of like that. In, a, in the shape of a, a donut or a toroid. Now, one other observation that's been um, verified is that if we have a current or a moving charge, moving charge is like a current, um, those charges will feel a force due to an external magnet. So this wire is carrying current because it's connected to the battery. And you see the direction of current, which is the flow of positive charge. And that's into the page here. So you basically put your right hand fingers in the direction of current and wave that uh, your fingers toward the direction of the field. So you place them into the page and then wave them to the right. And then the force that will be experienced will be the direction of your thumb. So try this on both of these pictures. So for the right-hand picture, you're going to have to place your fingers facing towards you and wave them to the right, and your thumb will give you the direction of this force. And from now on, we're going to call a magnetic field as capital B. That's going to be our variable. And so experimentally, we can determine that the force that this wire is going to experience is proportional to how much current it's flowing. So if we double the current if we have two amps as opposed to one amp or ampere which is units of current two amperes or one amp one ampere then uh, we're going to feel double the force on the two ampere wire so amp is a shorthand for amperes and if you've ever heard of uh, circuit breakers in your house being 15 amp or 30 amp that's referring to units of current or amperes also, if this wire is not perpendicular to the field, uh, less force will be experienced. So it's proportional to, force is proportional to sine angle. And force is also proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So we're going to define that field so that this equation ends up simply uh, F equal to ILB sine theta with no proportionality constant, or the proportionality constant is 1. And at that point, we'll call our um, magnetic field um, units of Tesla. So I'm going to talk a little bit in a couple slides about what a Tesla is. So this equation is actually a cross product equation. So force is equal to ILB sine theta. That is the magnitude of a cross product. And it's a cross product of two vectors, the IL vector um, and the magnetic field B vector for a uniform field. 
if we had a varying field, then we have to break up the force or, or the current into smaller segments of wire, DL. And then IDL cross B gives us the small amount of force. So we've seen kind of this, this way of doing things throughout the semester, breaking uh, complex shapes into smaller uh, manageable shapes that we can integrate. So that's what we're going to do here. So again, magnetic fields have units of Tesla, which is, um, if, you, if you work out the units here, divide force by I times L sine theta, and we'll see that uh, magnetic field has units of Newtons per amp meter. Um, we could also measure magnetic field in units of Gauss, which is a smaller, um, Teslas are, are smaller than Gauss, so a Gauss is 10 to the 4 Tesla. Uh, but for the most part, we're going to be using uh, the standard unit of, of Tesla. We need to understand magnetic field vector notation. Um, into the page, vectors would be denoted by an X, or sometimes an X inside a circle, which is supposed to be the tail of the vector. And out of the page would be the arrowhead of the vector, as shown. You've seen these in uh, introductory mechanics as well. Um, so now this slide is a little bit complicated, but um, I'm also going to cover this in class and we're going to go over examples. So starting with the IL cross B equation that just defines force on a, a wire carrying current, we, wa we want to know, well, what would be the force on a single charge? Because all a current is is many, many charges moving with some speed. Um, or just a moving collection of charges. You can think about a moving packet of charges as being that uh, IL. Um, so if we have N charges or N electrons or N protons moving, each with charge Q, they pass by a certain point in time and our current can be calculated by NQ, which is the total charge, divided by that time interval, T. So I equal NQ over T. And however far um, that um, group of charges traveled would be our distance L. And so L must be equal to speed times time, which is meters per second divided by, uh, excuse me, times seconds, which would give us units of meters. So L equal to VT. Now, if we plug everything together into the top equation, I is NQ over T times L, which is speed times time, cross B. And if we simplify, um, cancel time, um, we get NQV cross B out of that equation. And so this is the force on all of the charges, N charges. So that would lead us to understand that the force on a single charge is that whole thing divided by N, which is QV cross B. So this gives us a new equation, force on a single moving charge, QV cross B. And the magnitude of that, since it's a cross product, will be QVB sine theta. And again, if you're um, kind of getting lost in this slide, please review this in the book. I'm going to talk about it in class as well. And we're going to go over a lot of examples. So here's the right-hand rule. And it shows QV cross B gives us a direction of force. So here we have a magnetic field on the bottom uh, image going into the page. And speed is to the right. So QV, place your fingers in the direction of the velocity vector. Wave them into the page. And you will see um, that the direction of force would be upward. But... Why am I showing the force downward here? So that's a good question. And the answer is because this is a negative charge, as shown. So for a negative charge, we're going to experience the opposite direction for our force because recalling in the equation, Q is not absolute value, so the sign of the charge matters here. Um, and what is the, the trajectory of this charge? Well, it turns out if the field is constant, and the speed is constant, um, then when it comes into the, so when the charge enters into this magnetic field, whatever its speed is, um, 
this electron will continue in a circular path at a constant speed. So we're going to talk about this in class as well. So here is uh, a couple devices that use this um, idea of electrons experiencing a force in an external field. So if we have a hot uh, plasma material that um, we want to contain, something that could melt, say, a container, can be contained by exerting a force that will keep the particles traveling in a helix pattern like this. And um, this is something that could be used to contain antimatter, for instance. So hence my Star Trek joke for those of you that are Star Trek fans. Um, but I'm going to talk about more things like this um, in class, so hopefully you picked up um, good information in this presentation. Please feel free to email me with any questions, and don't forget to take the quiz.